to introduce our first invited speaker, Arnaldo Pugessi, coming from Italy, uh, but uh, he's been in Oslo for many years and professor of biostatistics there since 2003. Uh, Arnaldo is a statistician, apparently, world statistician today, I don't know why, but he's a statistician and he's made a lot of contributions to statistics, but uh, always with very clear applications in mind. Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, it's a pleasure to be in Leuven. It's a pleasure to be to Ida, 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 something like that. I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, I'm a statistician, as Veronica said. And uh, yes, I believe in inter interdisciplinary sciences. And um, in fact, the community you represent has been, for us statisticians, uh, uh, a mix of interesting, complicated, and challenging uh, um, uh, situations where we have learned and where we contribute very much. In some sense, the whole machine learning world has started out from things like this, and we, we should all be very proud of that. Uh, I, I like this idea of the first look um, uh, concept that you, that you mentioned. Uh, I guess what I'm telling you today is, is a first look. Um, it's the first time I give this talk, and uh, that's always a big challenge. You don't really know exactly how it goes <laughs> until you, it happened. Um, I, I, my, my background is uh, in, uh, in mathematics, um, so I, I do like the rigor of mathematics, but I try to take it with a certain suspense and, and um, leave some uh, details to others. Okay, today I'm going to tell you about, do you want me to use that microphone also or not? Can I move freely or can you hear me or not? Not so well? No. Okay, so then we stay here. And then um, I will have a pointer, possibly. No, it's fine. Like I said, but if you have a pointer, I might, is this a pointer? That is a pointer, I think. No. You get one? Okay, good. So Bayesian inference for rank data. I guess you have all ranked things in your life. If you like movies and you are on Netflix or no other things like this, then you get occasionally or quite regularly, in fact, uh, questions about your tastes and your preferences. And um, you get five movies and you are asked to rank them from one to five. And that we do systematically, and I hope you also like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Um, the ranks are everywhere. And they are used to collect preferences from users and clients about products. They are, they are in, inherit, they are in, the, see this here? Yeah. They are, um, they are uh, the basic of elections, where you compare um, candidates and rank them. They are behind all the money for funding that we get, when projects, proposals are ranked by panels and by referees. And they are, for example, in uh, genomics and biology, where genes are ordered according to, to their importance. Um, towards diseases, for example, in different experimental conditions. So a ranking represents a statement about the relative uh, importance, or relevance, or quality 
of items. Uh, and there are two actors in uh, two key actors. Uh, there are key actors in this game. It's the assessors, is the people that give an opinion, and the items that are um, ordered, ranked, assessors and items. And assessors are dramatically changing out in the real world out there. Um, statisticians have been uh, designing experiments uh, for a century now, maybe even more. Designed uh, panels are, of course, a way to collect um, opinions and rankings, but things are, of course, changing, and the world is made of volunteers that give their opinions because they like to give opinions, uh, and this produces interesting bias questions and things like this. Um, so what are the tasks? What are the things we have to do when we collect ranks? What are the objectives? Well, one, one objective is to try to merge, to aggregate, to find a consensus between multiple rankings uh, given by different people. So here you see typical examples, many people comparing four items. And the question is, so, so what does this group of people really like? And there is an enormous literature on this, of course, and many interesting algorithms on how to produce a number here on top that represents the uh, consensus, I would say, the aggregated information. Um, another slightly different task, which is also very interesting, happens when some of the assessors don't really give all their preferences. So here you see some assessors that only rank the first two bottles of Coke that they like most, right? And then the question is, what about the other two? So this is, um, this is another type of um, questions, a statistician would call it another type of inferential problem. And we need to fill out these things there um, by comparing, in some sense, these people here with the others where we have full information. And we not only want to put here a 3 and a 4 where it, we believe it's best, but we want, in fact, to describe the uncertainty about our decision. And that's maybe where statisticians really play a role. Uh, because the task is to say, so tell me here, what is the probability that there is a 3 or a 4? I'm sorry, these histograms are wrong. Um, the, the, the uncertainty is very important. It, it is a key aspect in making decisions. For example, if you would like to um, sell a book, as Amazon does, when you, when you start to go into their sites, they, would like to, they, they have an idea of what you like, and they have an idea of which book you're most likely are going to buy. But it is quite important not to know the book, but how uncertain the system is about that possible choice. And if it is too uncertain, maybe Amazon shouldn't spam us and shouldn't tell us. Just wait a little bit more before they start to give us advices and recommendations. So uncertainty is very important in many, many situations. Um, here's another task. Uh, there are many, many cases, mostly, where the group of assessors is not a homogeneous group. So they don't share any consensus. In these are different people belonging, let's say, to two different groups. So the first step is to divide them into two clusters, into two groups, um, which then are within homogeneous. And then the task proceed by saying, OK, what happens if I get a new assessor, a new client, uh, who expresses some um, opinions, and I need, as usual, to fill out uh, the ones that are missing, but also assign him to one of the two classes. And this, is, this here is, um, is called preference learning. So we are learning preference of a new person, which has expressed only some opinions, and we are learning by uh, comparing him to the homogeneous group cluster where he belongs to, where we believe he belongs to. And then, within this cluster, decide what are the items, what are the, is the ranking of the items which he has not uh, given an opinion about. So these are the tasks that I'm also trying to say something about today, and they are uh, quite standard. There's a lot of methods and a lot of uh, algorithms that try to solve this. 
Uh, I will, I will uh, tell you something about two uh, examples, particular examples. The first one has to do with movies. It's um, the movie lens data. Um, this is how the data set is described. Movie lens is a movie recommendation website. You tell me the movies you love and hate, and I will tell you the ones that you should look from now on. Personalized recommendations. Personalized recommendations, or generally personalized solutions, is a very, very important topic. In um, medicine, uh, it is called personalized therapy. And the idea is that cancer patients should receive the therapy they individually uh, need most. So back to movies. Uh, here there is a, a, an algorithm in, uh, in MovieLens that does this um, produce this recommendation? It's called collaborative filtering. And again, essentially, it matches uh, you with other people that have similar opinions about movies and look what films they have seen and then make a recommendation. In some sense, you are put in a network and your neighbors in this network are used to help to guess your preferences. Many thousands of users today, it started many years ago, it's run by the University of Minnesota and it is a research project. So this is not Netflix, which is a commercial project, this is a research project. where You can get data all the time and it's very interesting to test um, methods here. It's, it's a benchmark testing. And the other, but it's real, so people do it for real, it's not just um, a toy. And the other uh, example I'm trying to say something about for you today is uh, on genes. So this is meta-analysis of gene uh, expressions across different labs. And the, the, br briefly, what are these things? So gene expressions are a measure of the activity of genes um, in a person. So I collect some blood from the person, and everybody has about 20,000 genes. And um, by looking how these genes are active or inactive, we can try to understand conditions or phenotypes, are they, how they are called in so a few hundred patients, in my examples, it will be prostate cancer, um, I will show you, about 20,000 20, genes. And um, these, uh, uh, it's of course a very serious problem. Can we find the genes that allow us to predict how therapy will work in prostate cancer? Can we find the genes that can allow us early um, uh, um, diagnosis of prostate cancer? What are the genes that differentiate a healthy person from a patient with a person who has carries this disease. Um, and there has been a lot of uh, studies ar around in the world. And, and, and you can think them as, as assessors. Every study is an assessor and uh, ranks genes according to how they believe their role is in prostate cancer. And then, in this case, the genes are the items and the labs are the assessors, and you need to find the consensus. That is called meta-analysis in statistics. It is quite interesting because when you start to think uh, in terms of ranking, you have these two concepts, assessors and items, and you will see how they can be um, used in very different situations. All right. What I'm going to tell you a little bit about today is about a new approach in doing and trying to solve all these tasks. It's based on Mallow's model. It's an old model, um, very flexible model, as I will show you. We will do Bayesian inference, and it will require heavy computation with Markov chain Monte Carlo. I will have to tell you something about this algorithm, but then I will use most of my time to describe you some experiments that we've done where people, assessors have given full opinions about all the items, where they have given only partial opinions about the items, where we want to cluster assessors in different groups. And then the interesting case where uh, the assessors are not ranking, but only comparing items. And this happens, for example, if you go to Netflix, there you are not asked to rank five movies, but you're always asked, which of these two do you prefer? many times. Uh, preference prediction, individualized preference prediction uh, is my last point, and then I'll, I'll draw some rapidly some small conclusions. Good. Uh, if you want to read more, this is a paper that is um, on 
archive, and I'd like to thank my co-author. It's um, my PhD student, Oristan Sørensen, postdoc Valeria Vitelli, and Elia Arias, who is a very senior and famous Bayesian professor in Helsinki. The others are in Oslo. All right, um, formalizing a little bit. Um, you have little n items and capital N assessors. And Rij is the rank given by assessor uh, J to item I. So it's a number between 1 and n. Um, and so if you take assessor J, he will give us little n numbers from 1 to little n, telling me the, the first item, what uh, rank does it has, the second item, what rank does it has, and so on. And these uh, vectors are in the set of all permutations of n objects. That's the whole possible class. So a consensus ranking is also um, a vector of this type that uh, is um, the one that uh, shares the information about the group of assessors that we have in our data. We denote it with rho. Malo's model is old. Malo pro proposed this in 57. And then there's a very important um, both paper and book of Percy Diaconis, who takes a, prob prob a probabilistic view of the same model. And the model looks like this. Let's look to it a second. So here we have, so this is the probab this is a probability distribution for the vector of um, uh, rankings given by all assessors. So this is a, a capital N uh, vectors, each of small n dimension. And uh, the key point here is this distance. This is a distance between um, the assessor's opinions and the consensus ranking. And we're trying to find this consensus ranking here that somehow is closest in this distance to all the assessors, right? And, the, and here there is an exponential distribution. This alpha tells us how, um, I will say a bit more about this alpha. This alpha is an important parameter and it tells us something on how coherent this group of assessors is. It's interesting to find out how much alpha is, not only rho. Uh, and then uh, this thing here is a normalizing constant, because this has to be probability. So it has to be between 0 and 1, and integrate to 1, sum to 1. So we need a normalizing constant that will depend, because it is the sum of those things here. Here it is, the normalizing the sum of all these things over all possible permutation. So this is an impossible thing to compute. N factorial things here, it's too many, if n is larger than 10 or something like that. But this is what we need here to find out what is the probability of each um, data sets that we have and then to compute the most likely, for example, or the, the best fitting consensus ranking row. It's called partition function. And uh, I will have to say something more about it. And it depends on alpha and on rho in principle. So if we want to find uh, something about alpha and rho, we need also to compute this object here. Alpha, is, as I said, is important. So if alpha is 0, then this disappears, and then everything is easy. Then it's just a uniform sample, uniform perm uh, permutation of n objects. But if alpha is larger than 0, then we are trying to find the rows that are closer to R. And that's the interesting situation. You believe that assessors have opinions that make sense about the common um, consensus ranking. So back to this normalizing constant, which is um, slightly problematic if we want to do inference or if we want to do say something about alpha and rho. Because uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a hard thing to compute, but there's something that helps us right away. Um, and this is to do with um, special distances. For some distances, this thing doesn't depend on rho. And that's, that's good. So there are, these, there are distances that are called right invariant. And essentially, these are all distances where you can relabel the um, object, and the distance doesn't change. So um, most of the distances I will show you, or all of them, in fact, are right invariant. And they look to differences between the rank given by an assessor to item A, for example, and the consensus uh, given 
to that uh, item and, and their consensus uh, ranking of that item. And that's, that's different, is that, that difference or this individual distance is, is the key point. Now with a, a little bit algebra, you can see that you can, in this case, reorder things so that the partition function doesn't depend on rho anymore and you can take as the, the in this case, this uh, row as 1, 2, 3, and up to n, a fixed permutation. So this is very good, because suddenly this uh, partition function doesn't depend on rho, depends only on alpha, and this will allow us to compute it offside with important sampling, as I will show you in a minute. Okay, but still, even if we have gotten rid of the rho here, this is still a sum, doesn't depend, so this is now the sum of all possible partitions, uh, per, sorry, permutations. So this is still a, um, an, an intractable thing. But now we are ready to do um, inference or trying to estimate rho. And because this thing doesn't depend on rho anymore, if we want to do maximum likelihood, this is then our likelihood. It, has, it is the probability of, of our data set, the rankings given by the n assessors, each is a vector. And, and, and if we want to find the row, we have to essentially max minimize this sum of distances here. Here it is, the sum of the distance of the opinion given by assessor J, the consensus ranking, and summing over all assessors, and we want to find the minimum. And this is in, impossible, of course, for a decent number of objects. Um, I have to say something about um, the distances. What distances are really in the game here? There are many, many, many. There are maybe a hundred papers out there that propose different distances here. One very famous one is the candle distance. And the candle distance measures the minimum number of pairwise edges adjacent switches that you have to do to convert R to rho. So you switch only pairwise until you have reached that. And that distance is uh, famous because in that case we can in fact analytically compute this uh, uh, sum. And here it is. That's the sum. So this is now a completely feasible thing to do and um, that's why the candle distance is the distance that has been used in all, uh, in, I would say 90% 90 per, 90 of all the approaches using um, distances. But there are many other distances that have been, uh, that are of course interesting, and um, many of them are much more interesting and much more efficient and useful. Because of course the distance is important. It will, changing the distance will give you different results, and some distances allow you to do better predictions than others. So one that we will, um, we will consider very much is the foot rule distance. This is the sum of the uh, absolute values. So it's, this here is the absolute value of the rank given, uh, of, the, of, of the rank and the consensus for each object. So it's 1 minus 7, 2 minus 8, and so on. This is the L2 difference, where instead of the absolute value we take the square, and then there are many others, as you, many of you know. For all of them, the normalizing constant is NP-complete, so there's no chance of doing it properly. Um, this is a very special case. And I don't think there's any other distance that has this property, apparently. At least I, would, I don't know about it. Okay, You're Bay we are Bayesian, so it's not enough to give a likelihood. We have to give also prior opinions about all the parameters, all the things that are unknown. So what is unknown here? The, the consensus ranking is unknown. What is our prior opinion about the consensus ranking? Usually we don't have any opinion. So that's why it is simply uniform over the, uh, the set of all possible permutations. That's simple. But I will not mention it today, but if you have opinions about rankings, for example, if you, have, if, you have, um, if you know some characteristics of your assessors and you know that um, men like um, movies that has to do with sport, very boring, it could be, right? So you might want to to put this information here. That's, that's the entry point for uh, subjective or, or objective prior opinions about rankings of your assessors. 
Then we need um, a distribution, a prior distribution for alpha, and we take the exponential distribution, um, which has a parameter lambda, and we have to decide something about that lambda, and we take one over ten. And in, in, in Bayesian statistics, hyperparameters are both uh, loved and hated. They are loved because you can do almost everything with them. If I put you, by changing this lambda, I can make my prior in, inexistent or I can make it very informative. And this is quite informative if I put it to such a precise value. Why did we choose that? Well, the, the logic behind that uh, 1 over 10 in, in some examples, you will see, we will change it, of course. We, we think like this, that we believe our assessors are, are not crazy, right? So they have opinions. So they will not make very bad assessments with high probabilities. So the probability that they take an item that is in the middle of the ranking and put it on top is small. Let's say 1%. And then we just compute out if under these assumptions, and we get that 1 over 10. And if you believe it's not 1%, but 10%, you get another number. OK, now we have likely than prior, and now the Bayesians put this together in terms of posterior. The posterior is the distribution of your unknowns given the data. That's really what you're interested in, right? So these are our data. And we want to say something about alpha and rho. And the posterior is simply the likelihood times the prior. The prior was almost nothing here. So um, where's the prior? Here's the prior. So, so this is how it looks. And uh, it summarizes all the information we have about alpha and rho in the Malos model. And it allows to do, oh, here's a little bit things that are moving around, I see. Uh, um, if you want to have, if you want to say something on alpha and rho, if you want to have a point estimate, a number for alpha and a vector for rho, then you could take, for example, the mean of this distribution, or the mode of this distribution, or the median of this distribution. These are point estimates. If you want to say something about the uncertainty about these parameters, then you should look to the full posterior margin distribution. So alpha is not just a number but it has a distribution on all possible positive numbers. So show me that distribution, and I will know how concentrated that distribution is, so how, how much information there is in my data on that number, and so on the uh, consensus ranking. Give me the distribution of the consensus ranking so that I know how, how strong the consensus is around that ranking, the median ranking. Now, to do things with a posterior distribution of that type, with things like this, we need to run an algorithm, an MCMC algorithm, Markov Chain Monte Carlos. Many of you, maybe all of you know what this is, but I will briefly um, give you some ideas about It's an iterative algorithm that, at the end, produces samples from this distribution. So alpha, uh, we sample an alpha, and then we get another alpha, and another alpha, and another alpha, so we can make plot the histogram of those alphas, and this is the posterior distribution that I'm looking for, and I can take the median of the mode. Or if I sample from this distribution the rows, I will get many um, uh, permutations that are sampled from this distribution. I will get the most likely ones, and I can look to the histogram, or the, uh, I collect information from all this sample, and look to the posterior mode, posterior median, and so on. So the sampling from this distribution is what we need to do to say something on alpha and rho. Um, what do we do if we, if we are interested in um, things like uh, one of the assessors has given only, uh, um, uh, have on, has only ranked the first two items, or the top T items. So how do I treat this case? And then I would like to make statement of that type. I don't only want to find the consensus ranking. I would like to know what is the probability that that movie is among the top five, for example, that this guy likes. I'm not so interested if it is the first or the second. I want to know if it is among the top five. Um, what, is, what can we say with precision about alpha? And alpha has to do with how strong the consensus is in a, in a group. That is important. Um, what, how do we treat a case when the, rank, the assessors only do pair comparisons and not f rankings? All this can be handled within the Bayesian framework. We don't change the machinery at all. We just change the algorithm slightly. So that's a big advantage. 
Okay, I mentioned that we need an algorithm to sample from the posterior distribution, and that's the MCMC, or the Metropolis algorithm, that all of you know, I guess. So, to do this, the algorithm is based on, um, on, on a step where we, um, given the current value of alpha, we propose a new value of alpha, and then we decide to accept or reject it. And then in the next step, alpha is given what it is, we propose a new uh, uh, consensus ranking, and uh, decide to accept it or reject it according to where we, have, we are currently. So here is the, the two acceptance reject probabilities. So this is the probability to um, accept a new proposal row prime for the consensus ranking given the current, ones, current one, which is called row here. And you see essentially it's um, a ratio between the two posterior distributions. I tend to accept row prime with a higher probability, if row prime gives me a higher posterior probability. So I'm likely to move to, um, in fact, I move, I move to uh, with probability uh, one. I move to uh, uh, states that, to, to rankings that have high, higher probabilities, but I can also move to states that have lower probabilities with a smaller probability, not one. So this is an algorithm that, uh, moves in the space of all possible permutations. It's a random walk, if you want, in the space of all possible permutations, and just um, samples from the posterior distribution. And the same for alpha. Here, this is the proposal for alpha, alpha prime, and you see there is a difference here. But the big problem here is that you see, to decide something about alpha, I need to, to look to the ratios of the two normalizing constants. And that means that I really have to compute this guy here. Here it cancels. Alpha is fixed, so there is no uh, Z here. But here it's, it's there. So we have, to, we have to say something about Z. And um, uh, so briefly, what proposal uh, distribution we use? So the proposal distribution, the distribution is used to propose a candidate for a rho. Let's call it rho prime, given the current uh, state rho. And if you propose crazily, you will never accept because you are too far from where you are now. This is always a, 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 a comparison between your current state and this proposed one. And if you propose it at random, you are, you're, you're, you're going wrong. You have to try to go up in the, in, in, in the mountain of the probability, right? So you usually propose, use a proposal distribution that is around the current value. So you want to propose a rho prime that resembles rho as much as possible but a bit different. And we do it by using this algorithm that we call the leap and shift algorithm, and it's very simple. So what you do, you have your current uh, um, consensus ranking, which is a vector between 1 and n, uh, somehow, 7, 3, 2, 1, 5, and so on. And you take uh, at, uh, an item at random, u, that has a, a current ranking, rho u, and then you choose around row u, let's say you go 5 to the left and 5 to the right, you change a new value for that rank, for that object. So you give that object the value r. So you choose a new rank for, for an object. Now you will have two, two items in, in your, in your um, basket that have the same ranking and one item that has no ranking because he has lost his ranking. And now you just simply shift everything by one so that you fill up again, and there's a little bit on the border that you have to take care of. So this is a very natural and simple algorithm that essentially proposes um, a ranking that resembles the one that you have, and this L controls how much it resembles. And uh, for alpha, we use simply a, a Gaussian distribution. So we have an alpha, and we propose an alpha prime that is normally distributed around alpha with some variance, and, uh, and that's it. And here the problem is that we need these normalizing constants. We need to compute that. So how do we do it? And we do it by thinking that, well, this is really depending only on alpha. It doesn't depend on rho. So if we simply uh, compute this on a grid, grid it uh, um, uh, just by taking a grid of alphas from 0 to 25, something like that. 
and compute this uh, function on those numbers and then simply um, smooth this function, then we will be able to do it offline. We do it once forever. And we can simply then compute that function in any other alpha that is needed by our, our algorithm just by reading off from here. And this we do with important sampling. So important sampling, for those who don't know this, is a nice trick. So we have to compute this uh, impossible sum. So we first multiply and divide by um, QR. And QR is the distribution of R. So uh, we do nothing here, but we simply say this is, a, this is a distribution function of R. And R is the thing that we are summing over, right? So rho is fixed. And this is, um, this is simply the probability that this R has in the space of all permutations. It could be the uniform one. If it is the uniform, then uh, it doesn't help very much. But uh, if we are able to find a QR that gives weight to the uh, ones, to the, to the permutations here, that are important in this sum, because you see, this is exponential. Only the one that are quite special here, small, will have, a, will have an impact. The others will not very much in the sum, right? So what is interesting is that suddenly this thing has, can be seen as an expectation. So this is now an expectation of this quantity here. It's just um, a weighted uh, uh, form of this element that we, had, that we were summing before. This is now an expectation with respect to this distribution Q. So if I now can sample independent, independently from Q, I can approximate this with a sum. Here it is. So I sample capital K numbers from this Q, and then I simply approximate the partition function with this sum over K numbers. So I don't sum any more n factorial items, only K. And if Q is chosen in a clever way, these are the important Ks that contribute to that sum. So now the key of the game is to find a good Q that resembles as much as possible the Malo's model. Because the Malo's model is the one that really we would like to sample from. We can't, because that has the partition function that we don't know. But if we find something that is computable and, uh, and um, not too far away from the Malo's model, it will go fine. And here we take something that it's called a pseudo-likelihood approach. So essentially, we start with one item. We assign a value to this last item. Um, and then we, we have decided that, so we drop that. And then we assign the next one and the next one and the next one, right? By only keeping what is left. The, the last one, there's no choice, only one number. And, this, and every time we sample from a univariate distribution, which is easy to sample from, here, the normalizing constant is the sum of n objects, so that's not the problem. And then, the, then at the end, we end up by um, a ranking, a real permutation. And that, because we use the Malos model marginally in every step, that is not too far away from the real marginal, from the real uh, joint Malos model. And it works quite well. So here you see an example with 26. Uh, it has to do with our potato experiment. I'll tell you about the potato experiment in a minute. It, we had uh, 26 uh, uh, students there. So this is 26. Uh, well, you see that um, it depends on n, this quantity. It depends on the number it length. So we take 26. And here it's, uh, this is alpha. And this is the, log, the logarithm of the normalizing constant, z. It's decaying in alpha. That's all right. And this is how it looks if I just make 100 samples, if I use k equal 100. This is how if I use 1,000, and then 10,000, and then 100,000, then we have converged. So this looks fine. This looks very fine. And here's a case with 35. You see also here it, it, it's easy to make a lot of k can be very large, and very rapidly, because it's very simple to do these um, calculations. And we, are, we feel that this goes fine. Now, this is going to collapse if the items, the number of items, is too big. Let me show you some experiment now. I should have, yeah, good. So we uh, needed an experiment where we knew the truth. And what you do in this case, of course, you buy potatoes. We buy 20 potatoes. We put a letter on every potato. We put it on a tray in the middle of our lunchroom in our department. 
and ask 26 students to come in and without touching their potatoes, order them according to their weight. From the lightest to the heaviest. From the lightest upwards. And uh, they do it and they write on a piece of paper so they have ranked the potatoes. So now we, in fact, have data and we also know the truth because we all we can weight these potatoes and, in fact, find the real ranking. It was quite interesting because we phrased this uh, question by, by saying from the lightest on. And uh, we have a, a fantastic student from Iran and he understood it, of course, that lightest means with the lightest color because potatoes that are lighter are the best ones in Iran. And therefore, he, he was an outlier. <laughs> he, had, he was an outlier. So this was without touching. And, and these are, here are the results. Look to this. So this is, um, sorry, yes. This is, uh, here are the, the potatoes. There are 20 potatoes. This is the heaviest potatoes, and this is the lightest potato, right? So this is the true rank of the potatoes. And this is, for every potato here, you see a distribution over um, uh, the 20 possible ranks that this potato can have. And r red means that, that it's the distribution. So it's coming out like a slide from the table here, right? So it's very strong consensus that the heaviest potatoes is the, is, has rank one. Very strong consensus that the lightest are the lightest ones. In the middle, it sounds to be a bit unsecure. That's more difficult. And the potatoes here had a difference, two, three grams between each other. So it was really hard without touching them. So this uh, thing here represents the posterior marginal distribution for the rank of each potato. The posterior marginal distribution for the rank of each potato. So here's the potato. And if I look here, it's the posterior distribution of the rank. It's this potato here is very unlikely to be down, it's, not so, it's very unlikely to be top, it's between here, between 7 and 3 or something like that, right? It represents the uncertainty, the trace of this matrix represents the overall uncertainty, and you see again that it's the central potatoes that we cannot uh, rank properly. We also did the same experiment where we allowed our students to touch the potatoes. With two hands you can compare potatoes, right? So um, it's easier, and you see it's much less uncertain. It's still a little bit uncertain in the middle, but the rest is going quite fine. There's big, some interesting mistakes here that everybody does, uh, but, uh, but it's, it, you see there's less uncertain here, of course. Good, so the model works, and we can go away from our potatoes. Um, we'll come back to my potatoes in a second, but uh, we will see other interesting examples. It's the first time in my life that I really do an example and I collect data from scratch. And as a statistician of 55 years old, it's very late. But okay, it happened. Uh, what about partially ranked data? So here the idea is that uh, the assessors don't want to rank all these items and we ask them just to r rank the top five. And this can be uh, handled in the same model. Because if I give the top five, I consider my other 15 uh, ranks of the other 15 potatoes as latent, unknown, and I simply have to estimate it, like I estimate everything. They're called latent, and we do it with, with a well-known technique called augmentation technique, whereas we simply, these here are the N assessor's full rankings, where inside here there are some expressed ranking and the other are latent, unknown. And uh, we are looking, we are, the algorithm are really um, iterating between two steps. In one step, we estimate the missing uh, ratings given the given one and alpha and rho. And in the next one, we estimate alpha and rho given only the latent ones, the full ones. And here we use our standard algorithm, and here we have to do something slightly different, but not, not serious. And we end up by uh, having a sample from the correct distribution. And this is the example with the top five potatoes. So if you are interested in the top five potatoes, should we ask assessors to uh, rank the top five or should we ask them to uh, rank the top ten? And then we take only the five that are on top. And by looking to these two matrices, we can compare them 
and we see that in fact it's better to do the top five, slightly better, essentially because in the top five we have less potatoes in the game than if you ask to rank the top ten, and there are more potatoes in the game. Interesting, but the algorithm works perfectly. As an example of this is, uh, comes from genes, as I mentioned, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll show you, I have another 15 minutes, right? Or? No? Huh? Seven minutes, oh, that's terrible. Um, Metanizer genes, I will have to run fast. So here there are five uh, cancer experiments where they produce, um, each, is, each column is, a, is an experiment, by different uh, papers, 25 genes, the 25 genes that are important for that um, disease, prostate cancer. And if I use our method, I can produce things like this. So this is the, this is the top 10 genes that are the consensus of these five assessors. And um, this is the probability that that gene here is, um, is uh, on top, is the first. This is the probability that this, and then we drop it and take the next gene, the gene that has most highest probability of being first or second, and so on. This is the probability that this gene is among the top 10, 35%, 27%. You see, these are all small numbers. Very uncertain here. Five is too small. Very weak consensus. And if we compare it to what um, uh, other papers show on the same data set, they show another list, slightly different from ours, with connected with some numbers that are, not that are impossible to understand, to interpret. These are not probabilities. These are, these are percentages of soju times of a certain mark of chain. They can't be, we don't know what this means. We know it's higher than the other ones, but we don't know if it means something. Well, this number here shows clearly that there is no consensus here. So it doesn't make sense to really look for a consensus among these five uh, studies. Um, I mentioned the clustering of assessors. Um, uh, um, if you don't believe that the assessors is in one group, and here is our example. This is a sushi example. 5,000 people in Japan were interviewed, and they had to rank 10 types of sushi. Of course, you all recognize your favorite one here. And um, all right, and then we want to, we don't believe that these 5,000 people in Japan share a taste. So we have to cluster them, and we do it in a Bayesian way. And um, we have to find out how many clusters. And uh, by looking to within distance within the cluster, we find by the elbow rule that you should take six. It's the first time this flattens. And here are the um, maximum a posteriori estimates. It's um, the consensus ranking in each region, slightly different. Here are the light shrimps most. Um, here they, um, let's see. Yes, this sea urchin is, is either hated or loved. See, very different, right? So, and here are the regions of Japan. Yes, there are approximately six regions in Japan. So these are regional cuisines. Excellent, we found them. And here you see how uncertain we are for each assessors in how we classified the assessors into one of the clusters. Many situations, we don't have rankings, but only pair comparisons. So for example, do you like, I like Coke more than Fanta, Fanta more than water, less than water, and Sprite less than water. This guy likes water. And the transitive closure of these preferences is, I just add here the other comparisons that are not expressed but are implied. So here, Coke, Fanta, Fanta, water. So he likes water more than Coke. Here it is. This is a transitive closure. And then we can simply produce the ranking that is consistent with all the pair comparisons that are made. This ranking is incomplete, but we can augment it, as we said before, and produce um, the personalized uh, ranking that this person had without expressing it. And i show you two examples, and then I finish. So here it's um, football, English football, Premier League. Each Sunday is an assessor. And he made several comparisons about the items. The items are the teams. Um, and uh, here is um, the table of that season. Here's our estimates. And they, of course, are very similar. 
But what is interesting here is this is the, this is the confidence interval, the credibility interval, 90%. So Manchester, in our opinion, by looking to uh, the games of that season, has a high probability of being either first, second, third, or fourth, up to fifth in the ranking, right? And so on. This is very similar. But what is interesting is that up to Liverpool, they all have a chance to be first, but then it's finished. And from the bottom, I, I, if it is the, th if it is the, the, the three last that go down in the next league, then you see that all have a chance to go down up to Aston Villa. It's only Fulham that really doesn't play anything, right? Interesting. Um, and for the movie data, for the movie data, we have an example with about 6,000 users, movie lens data, 200 movies. Each assessor has rated in, on, in, in, in a mean number of 30 movies in this uh, data. We, um, this has been studied before. This is a paper where we uh, get inspired. In this case, we assume 14 classes, instead of estimating the classes, here we fix them for simplicity, we use gender and age. Um, and uh, for 200, the important sampling takes too much time. And therefore, we use instead something else to approximate the normalizing constant is, um, is an analytic approximation, essentially. And what do we obtain at the end? We obtain the, for each assessor J that has expressed only some pair comparisons, only some pair comparison, I find the probability, the full posterior distribution of his full rankings, given all the data. So this is the posterior probability. It's called posterior predictive probability because I predict rankings that he hasn't done. I'd say something on films he hasn't seen. It's the posterior predictive probability of the full ranking for assessor J. And it, it is completely consistent with the one that he has expressed. So if he has said that this move is better than the other ones, it's in that ranking, fixed. But the rest is estimated. By assigning this guy to the class where he belongs to, and by comparing his choices with the others in that class, and see what he would have said about a movie that, um, uh, that has, um, yeah. So it's called personalized recommendation, as I mentioned. And in our case, we tested in the following way. We discarded one movie uh, that each assessor has rated, put it aside, and then checked how good we are in, in estimating that. And we are the mid, and we do it uh, for all 5,000 assessors, 6,000 assessors. And the correct mid, the, the, and we compute the posterior probability of that thing there. And uh, the median is 0 0.8. So it's, it's, it's decent. You, you, if you have heard about the Netflix competition, it's a very different thing. But there, the winner had a 10% uh, error rate. So this is 20%. It's worse, but it's, it's a good starting point. And if you are deciding if he likes or not that movie more than others, by looking if the probability is higher or lower than, than, than 0 0.5, then we make it 12%, 13%. So that's good. OK, I think we can conclude. Do we have three minutes more? Yes, I have three minutes more. Let me mention that there's another, another, uh, one, one other line of research here is that you know, items change over time. Um, so politicians and assessors change over time. So this is an example where the opinion of the assessor changes in time. Political views are changing. Athletes are getting worse teams, new products enter the markets, and so on. So this is, in these cases, we have the latent ranking at time t and the latent ranking at time t plus 1 the next year, let's say. And we are, so this is what we've seen before, and this is a copy of it, but it's a different one. So the, the, the latent ranking, the consensus ranking are changing every year, and our model has to say is how much they change, and we say that they shouldn't change too much. So there is some smoothing in here, some we don't expect big changes from one year to the other. And this is done by the Mellows model, again, where you see we have the distance between two consecutive years in here. And this is an example with um, four years. Uh, each year, this is 15 high school students that have been tested in math, mathematics every year 
between four and eight tests. These are the assessors. Every test is an assessor by telling us which is, who is the best student and so on. And we see how they are changing time. So these the students are quite constant. So the, if you are not good in mathematics, stay, you stay down there. But, uh, but this guy here, he, he fell in love and something went wrong here, right? So, so it's interesting. Okay, let me conclude by saying that the Bayesian Maus model handles a lot of complicated situations and uh, in a uniform way, and it gives posterior uncertainty about uh, the estimates systematically. What has to happen more? Well, one important thing is covariances, information about assessors and items. How do they in enter the model? I mentioned something before. A very important area where we have some ideas is um, that when people do comparisons, pair comparisons, they are not consistent. So how do we do with non-consistent? Um, there's enormous literature out there, but how do we do it in our case? As I mentioned, there are many distances. Um, can we compare distances? Can we say something of which distance is better for what? Um, there are other ways of estimating the normalizing constant that we could test. And uh, not only assessors' opinions are changing over time, but items are changing can also be including. The main problem is that this is a slow algorithm, so this is not good for real-time analysis. Um, needs to be uh, uh, paralyzed and all those things to make it really good. And there is a problem of scaling with a number of items. There's not many problems where you have 200 items or, or, or 500 items, but there are, and we have 20,000 genes and 1 million SNPs and things like this. So we do need to scale this up in the number of items. And currently, we know that the important sampling stops around 200. And um, asymptotics is all right at that point, but we are not sure really how to do the scaling. Thank you very much. One assessor is inconsistent, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, the simple thought is the following that if you have one assessor that is inconsistent, then you double it. You make it, you make out of one, two assessors. And the second assessor is taking the opinions that are inconsistent with the, with the it, it's a clone. You make a clone of yourself, that's the Sunday opinion, that's the Monday opinion. So that's one way of doing it. Uh, the way we have implemented today is, is, is easier because it's easier to use this algorithm. And we simply sample from the uh, inconsistent opinions in our MCMC. We sample at random one of, the, one of the versions of the consistent. So at each step, we change the opinion of that person by sampling from his different opinions, one at random. But there is really a big literature on this, and it's it's in fact an open problem, I think. Mm. Very interesting open problem. Well, I have another quick question. Yeah, but his example actually had three, uh, three relationships, so you have to triple it, don't you? Triple it. Yeah. Okay. Quick question about your potato you, data. The, the problem with the clones is that the clones are clones. To define the clones, you can have five, six, seven clones. It's difficult. It's not an easy algorithm, right? Because you have to find the minimal consistent set of pair comparisons and and so on. So it's a difficult thing. I saw some curious some curiosity in the output they have. I think you might point this out, but the one where they were allowed to touch the potatoes around like three and four or something, they were like they were soft. Like yeah. Yeah. Shall I tell you the truth? <laughs> yeah, 
Shall I tell you the truth? The truth is that some potatoes had exactly the same weight. <laughs> yeah. No, there, there, were, there were two potatoes that were exactly identical in weight. So we simply randomized the order. And, and people understand it. So it's by chance one is larger than the other. Here it is a square. Oh, this one here. Oh, this, this, is, this is, I think, our, if you look to these two potatoes, they're very special. They have a strange shape. <laughs> so it's, it's, you do that mistake because they, one has a very strange shape, shape. It looks smaller than the other one, but it is, in fact, heavier. Yeah. Uh, it has to do, I, I think that, I think, I don't know these things, but the potatoes might not have a, con, con, uh, con, they're not homogeneous in density. They have some water more than certain parts. So they look smaller in volume, but then, and, and you, when you weight them, they, you think that they're, but, but in fact, they're heavy on one corner, and you don't catch it somehow like that. Everyone did wrong. Almost everyone, not everyone, almost everyone. Yeah. There's small probabilities floating around. I, I think you can, you can gain a lot by doing this more cleverly, by moving it up to the cluster we have and things like this. I'm sh you can paralyze in, in, in part, an MCMC can be paralyzed, not completely, but in part. So I think you can gain quite a lot, um, but you don't come to one million SNPs with, uh, with current computer power. So there is, there is and, and we have many problems where we have thousands, thousands of genes and, and things that, have, that are um, where, you know, the point is that there, you, you are ranking them by measuring a continuous quantity. Like when you make 20,000 genes, you're measuring the continuous expression. But the point is that you can't compare two different measurements of that expression in two different labs because they use two different equipments. So the ranking is, is um, and the errors are big. So, so it's easy to produce rankings of very many objects. So these data sets exist. While if you go to the internet, nobody wants, I mean, I can't ask a panel to rank more than 10 things, right? of interesting talks. So this, this seems to be like a really interesting and, and almost like a fashionable topic, but it's so, so difficult to get in since this, these problems have been kind of like tackled in various disciplines, like psychophysics, uh, experiments in the 1960s, and then pattern recognition, you have the edit distances, language by distances, and then partial orders and total orders in computer science and, and, and you know, various things. So is this statistics kind of like a converging factor now Now that we will have like one uh, nomenclature and, and uh, kind of like a set of solutions or understanding of the different solutions through this uh, framework? No, I have a book here that, that is about 10 years old. Um, well, I don't know here, somewhere. That is a good starting point. It's this book here, Martin. So this is a 20 years old book, but it, 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 um, it's a good um, summary of what had happened up to that point. Because as you say, this is an old story. <laughs> and this is a very good starting point. That, that covers both the computer science, the logic, the, the, and after that, it's an explosion, as you say. And absolutely, I don't have any overview. Um, I even don't really understand enough. Um, there are, there are. I mean, there, but, well, let, you, I start to be able to classify these problems a little bit. So we take rankings uh, uh, by keeping them discrete, right? One, two, three, and then there is the Plaquette-Lewis models. They're called. They are making them continuous. 
you can treat these numbers as continuous numbers, right? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, you can imagine that you get these integers, but it's a continuous model underneath. And if you do continuous models, it's a very different story. So these are two different approaches, both very important, and they are separate, really separate. And then there is, um, then there are all these peculiar um, problems, like inconsistent pair comparisons, right? That uh, challenge uh, more some models than others, and and and. Uh, but I don't, I I I don't have in my head any. Um, ordered uh, <laughs> picture of that area. I think it's, I think it's, it's um, we have started a year ago, something like that. It, the motivation came from protein modeling, because when we had date, protein data, we could not believe their continuous values, so we had to go to ranks, and then we it opened. But, I mean, ranks is a, is, is a way of robustifying everything, right? And uh, it's, it has been around for every, every, all the time. There's lots of rank-based tests instead than uh, t-tests that allow Gaussian distri distribution to be wrong and things like this. So, so it's a big area. And um, to my surprise, it's not so much used outside this world, right? But uh, I think it is interesting. And we will have more and more rank-type data in the future the internet. So it's worth it. Mm. Well, um, in our, in, in our uh, experience, we have, we have started a little bit to compare them. And you can intuitively understand that some distances are penalizing very much big mistakes. Some others are penalizing all mistakes in the same way. So, for example, if, if you, you, yeah. So, but in, in our simulation experiments, we see that it's difficult to recommend one, but it looks like this foot rule of or the Spearman are quite good, and uh, Kendall is not is not particularly good, but it's the easiest one to use. But I think it will be it will be very fascinating to start to look to the distances properly. And we haven't started to. Thank you very much.